Thank you very much, uh, Tiago, for, uh, and I'm really delighted to be here. Um, and uh, uh, the nice thing about uh, coming last in uh, a symposium is that much of what you had to say, other people have said, so I can just refer to Tiago and I can uh, uh, refer to uh, Dr. Bleiberg, uh, and uh, I won't have to do anything except thank you very much for listening and uh, go home. Uh, um, okay, um, is this about the right speed? Is this all right? Uh, I'll, um, if I get excited or anxious, I start to speak very fast. So you better not make me anxious. Um, uh, I want to first of all acknowledge uh, a number of people who've been working with us in the uh, Mentalizing Mafia uh, and uh, uh, whose work uh, I'm going to refer to. Um, that's George Gage, who was mentioned uh, before, uh, uh, but and, and Patrick Leuton, who was referred to, Anthony Bateman, whose uh, uh, work uh, with antisocial personality disorder I will draw on. Uh, and of course, you saw Dr. Bleiberg, uh, and you heard about uh, Dr. Sharp. Um, so there are a few of us, and there are a few of us in Europe. Um, and. Uh, uh, we pursue this uh, idea of mentalizing, which uh, 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 Tigas uh, referred to uh, uh, and defined very eloquently. Um, and I'm not going to bother defining, but I do uh, want to introduce you to this book uh, in English, uh, but it's... Uh, um, uh, a relatively recent release. Um, it's a new and improved version, and it uh, washes brains whiter, and uh, it's longer than uh, all previous versions. And uh, uh, if you don't hurry, there are only about 2,000 copies left, and it might run out. But what's rather nice um, is um, that mentalizing has been accepted um, as uh, uh, an idea, and this is a sixth edition of the American Psychiatric Association's textbook of psychiatry, uh, uh, and the review of that um, uh, actually uh, includes um, uh, a paragraph uh, that says psychosocial treatments have been streamlined in this edition to provide clinicians with a broader understanding of the concepts of all psychosocial treatments share at a deeper level and to allow busy clinicians the opportunity to review the individual psychosocial treatments in an efficient manner. In other words, they reduce the extent to which psychosocial treatments are covered in the new textbook. However, an example of concepts shared by many of the psychosocial treatments is mentalization, and a section on mentalization has been added to this version of the textbook. It discusses definitions and concepts related to the term mentalization. In addition, how mentalization relates to attachment is described in, uh, as is how it relates to psychopathology. Finally, the authors highlight how mentalization relates to multiple types of psychotherapies. So we made it. Uh, into the American textbook, and um, uh, this is our citation that uh, Tigger referred to, we, we are going up, 2015 has something to deliver, uh, but it's kind of going all right, um, that the term mentalizing is, is much cited. Um, and we did, we tried to look at how often mentalizing occurred in books, um, and uh, uh, Google, uh, has a, a, a facility uh, called Ngram that allows you to look at the frequency with which a word is referred to books. And you can see in a very uh, helpful way, mentalizing has been increasing uh, over 
recent years, and this is where we started publishing. And it's, it's really good that it's been referred to. There is, however, a little worrying thing here. I don't know whether you notice, but around the 1880s, there was an upsurge in the use of the word mentalizing. And of course, we wondered what this was about. Um, and we found that it was in relation to headache and neuralgia that uh, uh, mentalizing was referred to, uh, exemplified by this paragraph. Hammond has conducted a series of careful urinal analyses for the purpose of ascertaining the changes in the composition of the urine incident to the increased mentalization. From these experiments, he's led to draw the following conclusions. That increased mental exertion augments the quantity of urine. So, obviously, <laughs> we have missed a trick. Uh, but there is here a new measure of mentalizing that will be collected in the restrooms outside. Uh, um, anyway. Um, uh, so, um, I, I, I want to just say, uh, because I know that I will run out of time, I want, to, I want to just say what I want to say now, and then I'll say why I've said it. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, mentalization and human aggression are very closely related. And this has been touched on uh, by the, both the previous speakers. Uh, but the very simple biological reason for this is that mentalizing another person makes it really hard for us to hurt them because we feel them from the inside. Because mentalizing is an evolutionarily preserved capacity to allow us to experience what those around us experience. It, by default, stops us from creating intense negative emotions in other people. Therefore, if we mentalize someone, it is really, really hard for us to hurt them. In order to hurt them, we have to be able to stop mentalizing. So aggressive actions, then, are only possible if we are able to inhibit mentalizing. Mentalizing, as Dr. Bleiberg um, has said, is culturally uh, very important. And it may be it is important because it has the capacity to inhibit interpersonal violence. Uh, but it becomes maladaptive in the context of a life and death struggle. So, mentalizing may be a good thing to promote collaboration, but actually, it's a bad thing in terms of us being able to survive. However, improving mentalizing should, should, in principle, reduce interpersonal violence. Now, at this point, it's really important for us to recognize that much that we condemn violence, it is an essential adaptation that we have to possess, that we have to have. That in certain environments, that's the only way that we can survive, is by killing another person, or at least threatening to kill them. But if we are violent, we cannot collaborate. We cannot, as uh, again, previous speakers emphasized, we cannot trust. We cannot collaborate. So, um, the optimization of human creativity, which uh, I will touch on later on, uh, that is underpinned by mentalizing, is undermined by uh, violence. And this dialectic is the essence of the human condition. 
It's not something that we can escape from. It's not something that we will ever escape from fully. Now, interestingly enough, with the increase in the quality of Western civilization, there has been and there continues to be a steady decline of interpersonal violence. So um, these are the figures of homicide rates uh, between 1200 and 2000 um, in uh, Western countries. Um, that's Italy, this is England, that's the Netherlands, I couldn't find Portugal, I'm really sorry. Um, but that this is not something that's restricted to impoverished groups is shown by the percentage of deaths of English male aristocrats from violence. So these are the creme de la creme of England, only people uh, with, in the nobility. And what you can see that the number of individuals in the English nobility who died peacefully in their beds has increased dramatically. Other uh, interesting factors um, that one indicator that uh, violence is part of a culture is the legal um, uh, use of torture. Um, which was pervasive in the 17th century um, in most countries, but um, it gradually became uh, uh, abolished. Judicial torture became abolished uh, in England, in Scotland, in Prussia, in Denmark, in Sweden, in Bohemia, in uh, Austria, that was in uh, the middle of the 18th century, Italy, France, the United States, Sweden, Spain, the Vatican, and then Portugal. I, I don't think that you have anything to be proud of in this uh, regard. I'm sure things have changed a lot since uh, early 19th century. But uh, you, you'll be pleased to see that Russia is behind uh, in the abolition of judicial torture. Um, uh, there is a major, this is the good part of the story. The good part of the story is that violence has declined. Mapping onto this, this is work that we're doing currently with uh, Chloe Campbell. You can map onto those declines the way children are treated. So the better a society, a culture, treats its young children, the lower the level of violence by the indicators that I have just suggested. So there's a very clear relationship between the two. Interestingly enough, um, one of the things that happened is that in early, uh, in, in um, the Western world, uh, in medieval times, children were not regarded as agentive, were not regarded as individuals. So the exercise with the glasses, with giving and taking and giving and taking, did not take place normally because children were removed, particularly in um, more well-to-do families, to be looked after um, by wet nurses, were not cared for by people who had a genetic interest in the survival of that individual. And as a consequence, when these individuals grew up, they had easier access to a violent resolution of interpersonal conflict. They didn't as easily envision the mental states of those around them as those who were brought up to be agentive, who be uh, individuals who mentalized. And there is, as I said, a rather lovely way that you can 
uh, track this using historical analyses that this is they're going to share this interest uh, in history it's um, but so that's the good part of the story we've been you know we are much 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 nicer to our children than we used to be and I'll talk about it a bit later there is a nasty part of the story as well though and that's guns now what guns permit is the exercise of human aggression without the risk of mentalizing. So I don't know whether um, uh, any of you uh, have seen the recent um, film that's come out uh, uh, about um, uh, a, a sniper, an American sniper. Has any of you seen the film? Uh, yeah, okay. I, but you know, basically the idea is you have a gun and you look through a telescope and you can pick off individuals without any threat of actually knowing what that individual is experiencing, without any risk of mentalizing that person. And that makes actually murder very easy for human beings, just because of the way we are constructed. If you do not have to pilot the plane that drops the bomb, it's easier to press the button to kill, no matter who that person is, not to worry about who it is that you're killing. So whilst civilization has brought with it an enormous benefit to our children, and consequently a reduction of violence, civilization and collaboration has also brought with it a comparable facilitation of killing. So whilst we are benefiting on the one hand from better, greater civilization, that benefit is undermined by the iPhone. I'm speaking metaphorically. I don't think the iPhone is responsible for this. But the technology that it represents does carry major risks. Am I being clear about that? Okay. Uh, now, uh, um, interestingly enough, there's some very uh, nice findings in relation to guns. So, for example, the act of handling uh, a gun itself increases aggression. So, um, uh, it releases testosterone in boys particularly, but not only in boys, it releases testosterone in women as well. Anyway, uh, this is irrelevant, but uh, it's handling a gun, so as opposed to handling a toy gun. Um, we overestimate the likelihood of um, uh, our peers uh, carrying guns. So in school, American children carry weapons because they want to be protected from the weapons they imagine their peers have. Is, am I clear about that? So there is escalation that's built into the system because I imagine that you are carrying a gun and therefore I have to protect myself. And in some states in the United States now, Actually, you do not need to have any kind of psychological test in order to acquire a gun. It used to be that you had to have some, you had to demonstrate that you would not abuse. Now you no longer do in many states. So the risks here are tremendous. Um, um, uh, there are some countries. Um, that are more violent than others. In the United States, you're more likely to die of a violent death. But that is not because the country is more aggressive. It is because of the technology is more readily available. Um, so it uh, uh, is the carrying of guns that makes uh, the likelihood of homicide more likely. None of this is, I'm sure, uh, news to you, but is actually very relevant for the developmental framework that uh, uh, we believe uh, is relevant to 
antisocial personality disorder and uh, aggression. Because um, the potential for aggression is born in us, as it has to be, at least in some of us, in order to protect others in our troop. Um, in the majority of cases, uh, in the majority of cases, this potential for aggression is not fulfilled. But um, uh, the key for that to take place is, as both previous speakers emphasized, is the psychosocial environment that actually leads us to desist to forego aggression uh, in a relational context. Uh, as preschoolers, uh, we are, the, I, I often ask audiences to say, what age do you think physical violence is most common? And people usually say adolescence. The correct answer is at age of two. Uh, toddlers are most uh, liable for physical violence. And the um, important question here is what differentiates those who remain physically aggressive from most of us who learn to desist from uh, uh, physical violence? Um, it's the challenge is to identify um, uh, the atypical patterns that lead to uh, risk for future difficulties. And uh, this is a slide that uh, Dr. Bleiberg rushed through very quickly based on over 10,000 Canadian uh, children studied longitudinally. And this is the important group. The majority, by a small margin, this 31% of us who are never going to be aggressive. We call these people losers. Yeah, they're, you know, they're just too timid, too shy. They, you know, they, they're safe. They're not going to amount to anything. Okay, I'm joking. It's not for real. I'm sorry for the camera. I didn't mean that. They're the loveliest people. And that's, that's my wife is there with that 31%. Uh, um, me, I'm here. I started off at two with the potential to be violent, and I gradually desisted. A group remains violent. Actually, that 17% is too high. It's more like 5%. Um, uh, but uh, uh, we can uh, argue that. Uh, but what has show, been shown in a number of studies is that what differentiates these guys from these guys is uh, sociodemographic risk, poverty, low maternal education, single parenting, less sensitive involved parenting in the course of childhood, low levels of maternal education, mothers who started child rearing early, mothers who are depressed in early years, boys who are more fearless and do not engage in an attachment relationship, as Dr. Bleiberg mentioned, and those who experience maternal rejection. And these are the individuals for whom the glass doesn't get filled up, doesn't get topped up. Um, so family processes, things that occur in the families, um, can interfere with the process of socializing that would normally gradually inhibit aggression. Um, and in these family environments, children cannot learn to inhibit their potential to grab, their potential to achieve an end result through uh, uh, physical violence. Uh, and what actually I would suggest to you these environments have in common is a disrespect for the child's agency 
a disrespect for the child as a human mind, as an intentional being. That child is not mentalized, it does not prioritize mentalizing as an important part of its social adaptation for the future. I'll try and expand on that in, in a moment. But it also is usually uh, send the same message by a broader social environment that that individual is in. And I'll try and talk about that too. But these are some um, uh, findings from that Canadian study of 10,000 children. These are um, the uh, uh, characteristics of the families of those who do not desist from uh, aggression. They are less likely less likely to have positive interactions, more likely to have hostile, ineffective parenting, more likely to have, less likely to have uh, consistent parenting, and broadly, family functioning uh, is uh, likely uh, to be uh, unstable. Now, I've given the probability values there for that these, but that these findings may be due to chance. And I don't know how good you are at uh, 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 Polish notation, but that is a very small number. Uh, so, um, hostile ineffective parenting, for example, which is 0.02 times 10 to the minus 99, is uh, equivalent to the probability with this many zeros which is a lot of zeros. Um, but for those of you who are bridge players uh, and understand chance that way, it's a likelihood of 513 spade bridge hands when getting one bridge hand with all spades would take 20 million bridge players dealing 30 hands a week for 20 years. Okay, so it's not very likely this by chance. Okay. Um, now, uh, this kind of points to the role of attachment relationships. Uh, and uh, uh, as we had said, uh, attachment relationships in this context, we are thinking about as the basis uh, of uh, the acquisition of uh, mentalizing. Um, biologically, it's a very simple process. It's very simple. If an adult has sufficient resources available to commit to a human infant, then that infant is likely to be in a resource-rich environment. If an adult has to biologically protect itself because the environment is resource poor, it will not have enough resources to pay attention to the intentionality, to the agentiveness of that infant. And the infant has to learn to look after itself. So the biologically appropriate adaptation for both generations is for the parental generation to ensure her or his own survival in order to be able to reproduce perhaps under better circumstances and for the child to try and ignore what might be going on around him or her socially to put to use the metaphor the hat that's not can I, I need the cup I'm sorry, uh, to put a hand over the cup, to put a hand over the cup in order to optimize the chance of its survival. So this is a biologically highly efficient and adaptive system for all of us that we will not be able to actually overcome. You know, five times weekly psychoanalysis for 50 years will not overcome this system because it's built into our DNA. 
because this is the way that we have learned to survive. Okay, uh, I'm going to be very brief about uh, mentalizing because it's been uh, talked about a great deal, um, but uh, uh, it's uh, just to say, as everybody has said, that mentalization has its, at its roots the fact of being understood, the experience of being understood. Um, and uh, uh, it's uh, uh, what, what happens, the danger uh, is that emotional arousal, including the activation of the attachment system, that is concerns about being abandoned, for example, will inhibit mentalizing and uh, as a consequence, expose the individual uh, to risk uh, in a number of ways uh, in relation to uh, aggression. Uh, it does pose a problem for psychological therapy where we deliberately activate the attachment system. And I'll come back to that in a moment. But I want to uh, 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 test your mentalizing capacities uh, here. I want to ask you, are those eyes of someone who is joking, flustered, convinced, or desire? Come on, you're all, half of you, most of your mental health professionals, and all of you are human beings. So, uh, what, what is this? Is the correct answer. Now, it's very interesting. There, there's a number of items in, in this test. Uh, this is the only item, uh, that's why I used here, but there's a gender difference. Women are much better spotting that this is desire than men, who puzzle over it. I think there's a problem there somewhere. <laughs> um, anyway, um, now, I, I, I just wanted to... Uh, bring uh, a little bit of uh, things that, that would in interest you. This is football, okay? This is a personal trauma that I'm uh, bringing here. Unfortunately, Dr. Bleiberg is no longer here, but the, now 10 years ago, but it, 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 to me it's like yesterday, uh, in South Africa, England was playing the United States in the World Cup. I don't know if any of you remember that. Robert Green, whose name will live in infamy, let that goal in. <laughs> the ball was bouncing like this. And he, sorry, I have to put the mic down. He had his hand like this. Like that. You can see it there, like that. The ball went through his hands. Uh, I used to be a goalie. Uh, and the first thing that you're taught as a goalie is that you put your body between the goal and the ball. Okay? You don't... don't. That, that's good for a torreador, you know. For a goalie, it's useless. Anyway. Uh, so we drew 1-1 one, one with the United States, which was a terrible humiliation. Anyway, this is what he looked like afterwards. <laughs> was he upset, angry, disappointed, or frustrated? <laughs> All the above. <laughs> that picture tells a thousand words. But that's not why I'm showing you this slide. This is what the English fans looked like. <laughs> now, there's a reason for this. There's a reason for this. Uh, and that reason uh, is really at the heart of what we are dealing with here today. The reason for that is that the parts of the brain where mentalizing takes place, where mentalizing of the self, and mentalizing of the other takes place, are overlapping. So, 
In red, you see mentalizing of the self. In blue, mentalizing the other. And in white, the parts that are overlapping in the brain. I'm not going to do a test of anatomy here, but it, both in the medial prefrontal cortex, temporal parietal junction, left and right, pecunius, uh, and uh, temporal poles, um, the areas where we mentalize about other and mentalize about the self are fairly close. Um, and that is why uh, all the English fans felt uh, Robert Greene's pain. Um, much has been said about uh, attachment, and I won't uh, uh, prolong it, but it is important that it is triggered by fear, and uh, uh, the activation of attachment leads to proximity seeking, which is then uh, associated with the down regulation of affect uh, that leads to bonding and the creation of an epistemic trust, uh, a trust that uh, the wisdom, the knowledge, the learning that I can take from you is relevant to me. And more of that perhaps later. What I do want to emphasize is that mentalizing as an approach has uh, become an integrative framework which has probably important elements of a number of major psychiatric, psychological approaches within them. So cognitive behavior therapy values the understanding between uh, the way thoughts and beliefs uh, explain behavior. It also is critical in systemic uh, thinking where the relationship between uh, the thoughts and feelings uh, in, um, amongst family members, particularly when these are uh, benign, uh, actually explain uh, their behavior. So mentalizing family is a family uh, that uh, uh, engenders mentalizing in the children and uh, creates, uh, is, is, is probably the critical environment uh, for um, uh, a well-adapted human being. But the origin of mentalizing is in psychoanalysis. In fact, um, mentalizing as a concept uh, antedates neuroscience, uh, antedates theory of mind, antedates uh, our own work, not just in terms of the analysis of human urine, uh, but uh, in France, in the Ecole Psychosomatique de Paris, uh, uh, mentalisation uh, was a concept uh, and uh, 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 that might have, I think, be known to many of you here, that was very important to understanding psychosomatic conditions. So in psychoanalytic, psychodynamic thinking, the understanding of a person's resistance uh, is, is, is closely related to mentalizing, but actually social contexts are impossible to understand without contemplating mentalizing. Um, there are multiple dimensions of uh, uh, mentalizing in psychotherapy, and uh, uh, I will refer to these uh, briefly. Uh, Dr. Bleiberg referred to them, uh, and they are important um, because they, are, they correspond to neuroanatomical, neurophysiological uh, uh, dimensions, and uh, um, uh, they are very relevant when we work clinically, as you will see in a moment. So, uh, differentiating self and other, um, uh, adopting the perspective uh, of the other, um, but at the same time, um, uh, I think, uh, um, uh, reducing the impact of the other on the self uh, is uh, important. Implicit versus explicit mentalizing, challenging automatic assumptions, and uh, perhaps uh, less well known um, is the uh, dimension between internal and external mentalizing. So I can 
have an idea of what you're thinking or what you're feeling in one of two ways. I can try and judge your body posture, your facial expression. Uh, many of you have your eyes closed, so I could assume from that that you're bored and you're not particularly interested in what I'm saying. Or I can think that you're just contemplative and are really deeply stimulated by my uh, ideas. You don't have your eyes closed, this was a joke. Um, uh, but I can also alternatively take an internal perspective uh, which is uh, based around um, me computing what I in your situation might be thinking. Much more complicated uh, and much more challenging. But also, I can mentalize about uh, uh, feelings or about thoughts. And these are important dimensions. Uh, and they're important dimensions because they exist anatomically in different locations. Now, I will not uh, test your uh, patience by uh, going through these dimensions, but explicit controlled mentalizing and implicit automatic mentalizing are mediated by different parts of the brain. The basic point that you've got to take away, and perhaps there is just, if I'm going to make one point for you, this is the point. Mentalizing is not something that's either present or absent. Mentalizing is built into our brains. We cannot stop mentalizing. We could try, but you can't abolish it. What we are talking about is mentalizing that's more or less adequate to the task. And it becomes inadequate to the task when it's imbalanced, when one or other of these polarities starts to dominate the process of mentalizing. What is uh, important here um, is that we recognize um, that in helping an individual to mentalize, we have to address an imbalance of mentalizing, not create mentalizing. We could no more create mentalizing than we can create a lung or, or a foot. Um, it is something that we have to correct and readjust. Now, one of the things that had been mentioned uh, earlier has been mirror neurons. And that's very, very relevant uh, to the kind of uh, social experiences that generate violence. As uh, uh, the example um, that we heard about earlier, I forget the place where this took place. Uh, the policeman who... Huh? Gira, okay. Uh, I'll, I'll, it's obviously uh, very significant here. I can assure you incidents like that occur in England as well, um, um, and, and worse. Uh, but the social environment in that situation makes individuals overly sensitive. It's not that mentalizing simply disappears. It becomes overly sensitive to the social context. So there's violence around me, and I, that is contagious. I will catch that violence. I will respond violently to it. My mirror neurons, the part of my brain that responds to the social environment through imitation, come to dominate over a part of the brain that would reflect on that and be more explicitly mentalizing and reflective. Is that, is that clear? So that's really where, where we are. And you know, that's not just negative. Um, that can be positive. I don't know whether I can start this. Uh. That is going to make you laugh now. Ready? Yeah. <laughs> 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 
Okay, uh, so uh, this uh, facility that we have of uh, 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 acquiring other people's mental states is, is obviously uh, uh, an important uh, aspect of what uh, uh, makes us human. But in individuals with personality disorder, what you notice is a, a vulnerability to a bias. Uh, in these uh, uh, dimensions. So individuals with, uh, say, antisocial or borderline personality disorder are more likely to favor the implicit automatic end uh, of their dimension, being impulsive, quick, making assumptions quickly about others' thoughts and feelings. And that, because they do not reflect, can make them cruel. Uh, uh, in, uh, they are also very externally focused um, uh, and as a consequence the hypervigilant judging by appearance and uh, 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 they, they are really concerned about uh, obtaining evidence for others attitudes from their behavior uh, at the same time they lack conviction about their own ideas. They do not have a sense of, a stable sense of subjectivity. Uh, they are more focused on affect states um, uh, and uh, um, with the logic of the immediacy that emotions bring. If I tell you, uh, look, okay, I'll be self revealing. You said that I could be self revealing because, okay. Now, I have a protrusion between uh, L3 and L4 in my, my spine. It's called a slip disc, okay? I'm distinctly uncomfortable sometimes, okay? I have back pain. I don't know, any of you have back pain? It's very common. Sometimes, you know, I say to people, my back is really hurting, and just fleetingly I notice that they're not believing me. They're not taking me seriously. I could kill them there and then. <laughs> Their life hangs by a thread, and I'm not a violent person. Okay? Um, uh, the, the issue that I'm telling you, nobody can tell me that a feeling that I have is not real. It is, I feel it, therefore it's real. Uh, would you agree with that? Cognitions are very different. Cognitions, you know, I, you know I, I'm thinking that uh, Dr. Bleiberg is uh, having, uh, he had coffee this morning. I think that it may be true, it may not be true. One of the things that cognition allows is that a distance between physical reality and mental reality. So, what, if you start using your logic for emotions in relation to uh, cognitions, you have two problems. First, that you take your emotions overly seriously, that they become something that dominate your life. It seems like you're overly affected by your emotional state. And your people tell you that you are, your emotions are dysregulated. They're not any more dysregulated than yours or mine, except that they are not inhibited, not contextualized by cognition, as it is uh, normally the case. Um, but more important, because you extend the way of thinking about um, cognition into your way of thinking about uh, cognition, so that you think about cognition as if it was an effect, as if it was an emotion. 
what happens is that you cannot believe that anyone can have a perspective that's different from yours. So the way you see the world is the way the world is. And therefore, if you start arguing with that person, that actually there is an alternative way of looking at the world, they feel about you the same way that I feel about you when you tell me I don't really have a backache. Do you see what I'm getting at? You take your life into your own hands. And that's what happens when we deal with antisocial personality disorder. If you do not take their perspective as the only perspective, you are really at risk. And I used to work with violent young men. And one of the things that I learned very quickly, that if I wanted to keep my nose exactly where it was, in the shape that it is currently, I would have to take them extraordinarily seriously. I, couldn't, I could make jokes as long as the jokes were about me. Any other jokes were really, really bad news. I can give you an example of that, but uh, if I have time. Okay. Uh, but also, as I indicated, they are um, extremely sensitive to uh, the social environment around them because the reflective, explicit, controlled, conscious mentalizing is not there to inhibit. Uh, I think, as a consequence also, uh, uh, they become uh, very rigid and very resistant to our influence. And this is clinically incredibly important. You as a person, you as a clinician, which of you, put your hands up, if you don't feel that you're a good person as a clinician, if you think that you have evil, malign motives in your clinical work. We don't necessarily think we are very, we think, most of us think we are benign. But if you think of yourself from the point of view of a client, of a patient, whose sense of themselves, whose internal sense of themselves is fragile or vulnerable, and who is overly influenced by the social environment they are in, in terms of formulating their ideas about their own mental states, then you are a threat. You destroy whatever vulnerable sense of self they might have. And they have to protect themselves from you by being rigid, by dominating and controlling you. Because you, just by being yourself, actually feel to them as a threat. And we often don't appreciate, just because we are so good, and we wish for so much good for all our patients, we just don't appreciate how much of a threat we are to them. Anyway, um, it's, that's me. Okay, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll rush through. I just want to show you uh, one uh, illustration. Because mentalizing is a problem. Mentalizing is a problem um, in the sense that it's sometimes put to evil use. That there are individuals who do not feel the experience of others adequately, who cannot actually uh, be interior focused in the way of putting themselves into others' shoes, who actually are able to hurt people because they are not limited by the impact that their actions have. And this kind of um, uh, mentalizing um, that is, uh, I think, a, a major uh, uh, problem in many instances with antisocial personality disorder um, 
I, I, I want to illustrate this um, uh, for you. Let me just see whether I can get this working. Food. You know, I just couldn't stop thinking about it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I went to the fridge and I opened up the meat drawer. You know what the meat drawer is, right? Yeah. What was in there? Well, I'll tell you what was in there. You know that bacon that's like maple? It's got maple flavor. The maple kind, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. I took that out and I thought, yeah. I know who would like that. Me. So I ate it. Oh, no. You kidding me. Nope. Not kidding. You know, I also noticed there was some beef in there. Yeah, you know, steak, you know, juicy. Well, I ate that too. <laughs> But I went back to the fridge just a few minutes ago and I put something together really special. You're going to love this one. I took some chicken. Yeah. I put some yeah, I yeah. put some cheese on it. Then I covered it with Covered it with what? I covered it with cat treats. Yeah. Then guess what? What? I gave it to the cat. Ah! <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you recognize uh, the uh, uh, this kind of um, uh, mentalizing that is, 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 is put uh, uh, to... But the point I'm trying to make is it's not an issue of mentalizing present or absence. It's the balance of these different parameters, these different dimensions that we're clinically concerned about. Now, I'm going to skip a, a number of slides which are very exciting, uh, but they cover things that people have covered already. Uh, including my Shakespeare slide, which I'm very proud of. Anyway, um, uh, and I uh, will just talk about our clinical work a little bit to give you an idea of how we work clinically. Um, so what is our technique? Um, we keep things simple. We keep things emotion-focused. We focus on the patient's mind and not allowing ourselves to be distracted by their behavior. We are working in the present, currently, in working memory. Uh, we also use our own minds as a model for the patient, marking for them as clearly as we can how we would feel in a particular situation that they describe. And we identify non-mentalizing uh, and help patients recover it in the many instances uh, when it's lost. So to be more specific about that, we focus on a break in mentalizing. When the person has, is being psychic equivalent, when they know absolutely what's on somebody's mind, or but they are in pretend mode when they're talking rubbish, basically, uh, uh, and they're just fantasizing about mental states, or they are too focused on a physical outcome. And we rewind to the moment that we understood. The most important thing is we do not engage with non-mentalizing. Mentalizing cannot combat non-mentalizing. When a patient is not mentalizing, you do not ask them to reflect on why they might, have, might be non-mentalizing. What you got to do is you got to rewind to the last moment that you did understand. And uh, in that context, uh, you explore what led them to stop mentalizing. What was it that actually created the difficulty. And you try and explore that. You do not explore what was non-mentalizing. So if they accuse you of, you don't care about me. You know, I'll give you an example. With a patient, I just briefly glance at my watch. You looked at your watch. You're bored. At that point, I get anxious. No, 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 I'm not, no, I'm not bored. Uh, I just wanted to see how much time we had together. You were bored and now you're lying. Uh, 
I, I just, you know, I, I want to understand why, why you seem to be feeling angry. Why, why are you, I want to know why you're feeling so angry. I'm angry because it's a bloody waste of time. I've been coming for six months and nothing has changed. I see, you, you seem to be feeling very angry. I'm bloody angry. Does that lead anywhere good? This discourse is going, as the English would say, to hell in a handbasket. Why? Because I'm immediately, I try to, to force my own perspective on the patient rather than, I try to say, no, I'm just saying what time we are together. The patient at the moment is feeling that I'm bored with them. And what I've got to do first and foremost is validate that perception. For them, at that moment, I'm bored. And me trying to make excuses about that will lead to nowhere good. Men trying to get them to see my perspective is hopeless. So, uh, very simply, um, we need to identify our own contribution to that and, and say things like, I'm sorry, I made you feel that I was bored. I'm sorry, it was unintentional. I just validated, I just acknowledged. That's very simple. Saying sorry is actually very good. I don't know how you say sorry in uh, Portuguese, but it's a good word to practice. Anyway, and we then try and mentalize the experience in the context of the therapeutic relationship. Um, so what should, uh, and, and I'll come very quickly to a, a, a stop. So what should the therapist aim to do? Uh, the mind of the patient is the only thing I care about. What I'm trying to do is to help the patient learn about the complexities of their thoughts, their feelings about themselves and about others, how they relate to their responses to situations, and how mistakes in understanding can uh, lead to actions that are inappropriate. It's not for me to tell the patient what they are or they are not thinking, how they should or shouldn't behave. And in fact, any therapy that tells the person that what I think you're really feeling is X, Y, or Z is in my view undermines whatever small capacity that individual has for mentalizing. I'm not there to tell the patient what I'm there to do is to be curious, to be inquisitive, to be not knowing, to encourage uh, mentalizing. And that not knowing stance uh, and the acceptance of different perspectives is at the heart of what we do. So we do a lot of questioning. We do uh, not feel the need to understand other than to be able to see the world from the person's perspective. And a very important part of this, that we model un honesty and understanding in terms of our own selves. We admit when we are wrong and apologize. And a lot of the time, unfortunately, with these patients, we are often acting out. We often find ourselves doing things that we don't normally do. But misunderstandings are wonderful opportunities for enhanced mentalizing. So, uh, and I'll end with this slide. What's essential about mentalization-based approaches is that we keeping it in the room with us in the moment. It's also essential that we are not sitting opposite the client. We are sitting side by side with the patient, trying to see the world from their perspective. We explore in that relational context, in the context of us exploring uh, their world, uh, not just their mental states, but also how they relate to uh, others besides us. At all times, we are keeping an attention, as much has been said about this, on the patient's level of arousal. 
that we try and maintain that within tolerable limits. And we are very dogged about not engaging with anything other than mentalizing. And if the patient loses control, we step back. Uh, we apologize and we start again. Then I hope give you a little bit of an idea. Uh, I could, I stopped short of giving you all the wonderful slides that shows how effective our treatment is. Just take my word for it. We've got some data that shows that it actually works. Okay, thank you very much.